I'm not going to delay any longer. Go down to the, the link below, support PitchCon, but let's bring on our wonderful panelists. Uh, first is Steve Gardner. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thanks, Nick. Appreciate you having me. Oh, of course. Oh, I love these board games you got behind you. Look at oh, this. Oh, I know. This is, this is the uh, computer room where we store all of our uh, family games that haven't been touched for a while now because the kids have moved out. Oh, but, man. Uh, well, they look great. It's a good selection. Every I feel like every family needs a good selection of board games. It indeed. Like you have them. Yep. I have an Orioles hat up there, too, uh, and some bobbleheads, uh, probably above my head. Hey, but, Fast uh, and Palmer will tell you that they always need more Orioles fans. So exactly, exactly. It's good to see that. And I love that you got a 2020 World Series uh, hoodie right now. Yeah, yeah, I know. That was um, it was a, a neat little thing. I, I've done some stories uh, from MLB, MLB Network, and uh, they just sort of were appreciative of me. And uh, I, I appreciated that uh, they sent this nice little uh, nice little pullover at the uh, just it looks for great, being nice, I will yeah. say. Um, yeah, so we're going to bring on our next guest as well, which is Janice Scuria. Welcome, Janice. Hey, Nick. Hey, Steve. How you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Hey, Janice. Of and I, I'm guessing you're wearing your credentials right now. Yeah, actually. Love it. So I uh, strategically positioned my camera. Um, so uh, there was not much going on in the background. It's just the icy, cold landscape of Chicago mm -hmm. in my, my backyard. So, uh, yeah, I actually have my credentials right in reach on my bookshelf. So I decided to wear one in particular that I feel uh, very strongly uh, towards, which is the credential that I wore for Lucas Giolito's no-hitter. But I could always talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> I remember, yeah, I remember actually you seeing out the tweet of seeing uh, the you know, Chicago White Sox celebrating on the field. And um, I don't know if I've been as jealous of anyone on Twitter uh than i was of you in that moment um, amazing but yeah we'll certainly get to that uh but yeah what i wanted to do with this is well being a credentialed mlb journalist it's it's there there isn't much discussion about it about what the process is i uh, you know we all start from a certain place of hey i want to write at some point i want to be involved in baseball it starts with maybe uh, a a post on a forum or sending something to a blog or a newspaper, whatever it is. And we dream of that moment. Wow. I actually get to talk to these people and have that original story where I'm not relying on anyone else. But that seems like such a far journey, such a tough bridge to cross. And there is a certain process about it. There's a certain expectation. There's certain ways you have to network to be able to get to it. And it's interesting, you guys both have two different perspectives because Janice, uh, you were credentialed just this past year. So you only know the pandemic life of this, which I think is a very interesting story in itself. And of course, Steve, you've been credentialed before this as well, so you can give that perspective too. But I wanna start really just with the foundation um, and where you both are coming from with this. So we'll start with you, Steve. Uh, when did you, you know, what was your first gig when it came to getting credentialed and what game was that? Well, uh, I go back a little bit uh, further than, than Janice does uh, in terms of being in the business. I was actually in, in broadcasting before I got into the print and online journalism. Mm. So I, I think the first major league game that I remember covering was an Orioles-Yankees game, uh, probably 1988 or something like that. My, <laughs> um, my radio station... A lot. I was working in Charlottesville, Virginia, and my radio station somehow or another got me credentials to go cover an Orioles Yankees game in uh, in Baltimore's Memorial Stadium. And um, I remember being very nervous. Um, I made one of the critical mistakes that you're not supposed to make as a as a journalist on the field. I, I during batting practice, I came up to somebody near the batting cage and asked if I could uh, talk to them and do an interview. Uh, no, you can't do that. You have to be back <laughs> over here. So, I mean, instant embarrassment. But um, I really started covering games on a regu more regular basis when I came to USA Today. And uh, that was around 2000. Um, I covered the 2000 World Series. That was the first of something like 18 or 19 World Series I've covered now. And um, it, it does help, obviously, being a part of a major news organization that you don't have to worry about, you know, are they going to credential you? Sure. Um, just, you know, being, you know, what, what game do you want to cover? Okay. Get that set up and uh, talk to the PR people and, and you're okay. 
So, so that was as simple as, I mean, it's different now because now they have a whole online portal. You have to fill it out. Right. You have to say what game it is, what's your affiliation, get in contact with someone involved to make sure that they want to talk to you in the first place. I mean, if you're not as part of uh, uh, USA Today, USA Today said, yeah, yeah, it's, it's Steve, like whatever, get him in. But for us, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that guy said that he wanted to talk to me. Like, can you go talk to him and make sure this is okay, right? And but back then it was just as simple as a phone call or uh, something yeah, like that. Yeah, pretty much you would a phone call or write a letter uh, right? to the PR department <laughs> and uh, and send that in there. Um, you know, for a radio station that wasn't covering games on a regular basis, you know, it was a special thing. So you get in touch with the PR, which is essentially you know what you do now if you're an independent blogger or whatever and you want to request credentials, you've got to go through the PR department, and if they have right. space for you then um yeah it's uh it's generally they like to say yes and uh it's it's changed to some degree and i don't want to monopolize the conversation but when i was working for usatoday.com the website i mean there was a very distinct difference between online media and print or broadcast media and they were pretty stingy about giving online uh, sites credentials and thankfully that's uh it's gotten a little easier these days yeah, we had to, uh, we got super lucky uh, with uh, Ian Post put out an article about uh, Jake Faria that he saw, uh, at least his fiance saw on Twitter. And then through that, Jason Collette then helped us get into touch with the person with the Rays. Uh -huh. And then we were able to go through Jacob Faria and that. And then we essentially like flew him out there because of the craziest thing. This was like the second year that we existed. You know, and we were going nuts. We were joking that we were, he was going to sleep on Faria's couch or something like that. <laughs> Um, and that whole process, it was really tough to do, but we were really lucky that the Rays were receptive to this. While we've had other clubs that, nah, they won't, they don't want anything yeah. to do with us. They don't they don't even care whatsoever. Um, so Janice, with you, how what was that initial process like for you? What was your first game uh, that you were credentialed for? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so for some backstory, uh, I was writing for an independent blog called uh, Southside Hit Pen. And uh, Southside Hit Pen uh, very serendipitously was acquired by Sports Illustrated uh, right mm -hmm. before uh, the, the pandemic season. So uh, yeah, that was a really pleasant surprise. Uh, it, uh, our editor, Brett Valentini, just kind of came out with that news out of nowhere. Uh, so that basically means uh, that being credentialed would be a, a lot easier seeing as how we were affiliated with a major news organization. So uh, yeah. Uh, we essentially had a small uh, team of beat coverage. It was myself and three other, um, uh, I guess, senior writers. And uh, yeah, we all just kind of uh, divvied up the games. I kind of saw who was available, who could cover what. Uh, so the first game I covered was actually um, an intra-squad uh, scrimmage game that was uh, during a summer camp. Uh, so it was, yeah, the White Sox versus the White Sox. It was the uh, black shirts versus the white shirts. Uh, Definitely anything kind of went. No one had names on the back. And from a guaranteed rate field, when you're in the 300 level in the press box, you could barely kind of see who's who. You're just kind of squinting and kind mm -hmm. of uh, relying on all of this extraneous knowledge, uh, just mainly because you're seeing all these players, you're seeing them uh, kind of uh, work out for the first time. And of course, like everyone wants to know, seeing as how everyone had been so deprived of any baseball whatsoever, like, hey, um, who is looking like what? So what's Tim Anderson going to look like this year? Um, say, uh, what are some of the uh, hot prospects that everyone's been talking about? Like, what do they look like later, lately? Everyone wanted to know about like Andrew Vaughn and everyone wanted to know about your mean Mercedes. Uh, so yeah, that was a, a really interesting game to cover uh, just mainly because, uh, yeah, I kind of had to talk about uh, who on the White Sox was beating who else on the White Sox. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, yeah, other than that, uh, I also had some really, um, I guess, deep and intrinsic, intrinsic thoughts on, uh, say, my privilege itself and how it was a huge privilege to cover baseball during a pandemic. So I wrote a lot about that uh, and, uh, yeah, my feelings towards uh, just the entire situation in general. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I really loved that first game to cover. Definitely. And do you remember the first person that you interviewed, Janice? Yeah, uh, so the first person I interviewed ever was Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson is okay. I'm I'm a believer, by the way. I think not a bad interview too. Yeah, He's yeah, very yeah, ex good. yeah, exactly. Like, how did that go? 
Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't hurt that uh, uh, Tim Anderson is just one of the friendliest people I've ever met. Uh, just not just in baseball, but uh, I guess in in life. Um, I don't think uh, I've ever had uh, an easier time interviewing anyone else. Uh, but yeah, uh, Timmy's not only just just super personable, super friendly. Uh, he's also just very uh, passionate about what he does, and you can tell that he's so passionate about what he does. And so, like to quote him briefly, he just like he told me that uh, after I asked him, um, "Hey, uh, so before the season starts, uh, I, I know a lot of people have been talking about your defense. So what have you been kind of doing to improve that?" And he just just basically told me he's like I'm working baby I'm just always working yeah always working <laughs> yeah. he also just says baby a lot he wasn't calling me baby just to sure yeah like, clarify that <laughs> but yeah he's, he's just such a fun like warm bubbly personality love him so much definitely I mean it showcases he showcases inside of every single at bat too I mean the way he is aggressive at it but it brims you know he's brimming with confidence and that's really an expression of that like he's he knows it's a slider. Doesn't matter if it's in the zone or not. He just goes and hit it. It's yeah, amazing. He can he can hit anything. Like yeah. he just makes the adjustments last minute. Uh, so just the amount of contact he makes is incredible. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking about the the players exactly. That's not why we're here for this panel. <laughs> not at all. Uh, back to you, Steve. Yes, yeah, same same question. Do you remember your first interview? I do. It's not very exciting, um, <laughs> but uh, it, the 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 one guy I guess that I had confidence to go up to first was a Yankee utility infielder by the name of Bobby Meacham, who uh, has stayed in the game uh, for a while. I think he was uh, a coach and and has been in the game for for a while. But um, yeah, it, it's it takes a while, at least for me. And I'm kind of a a reserved and shy individual deep down. Uh, but this, you know, this job makes you be more extroverted. And so you learn how to go up to players, you know, even the big stars. I mean, so I, I admit, you know, I've when I had to go up and talk to Barry Bonds, my heart rate. Oh, yeah. Increased considerably. Um, I think of there, there may have been a few. Cal Ripken is another one who I watched and was a favorite player of mine. It's really um, you know, nerve wracking a little bit to go up and interview somebody who you've looked up to. Um, and I think one other person that I can remember being that way with was Hank Aaron. Uh, when, um, we had the, the Aaron awards that are, that are handed out during the playoffs. Um, you get, you get really, really nervous when you're in the presence of greatness and, uh, it takes a lot to, to get over that. And it, 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 I don't know that it you ever really completely get over it, but uh, it gets to be more routine to where it doesn't paralyze you anymore. Sure. I mean, that's such a hard thing, that that icebreaker, the way that you approach them. Uh, do you have any tips for anyone else that's just starting to get into this? Like, how do you do you just like tap them on the shoulder, say, hey, can I ask you a few questions? Do you you know make a comment that's not about the question? Well, what is your go to with that, Steve? For me, I, I think I first start up with, hey, you know, Trey Mancini, if I'm coming up to, hey, Trey, do you have a second? Do you have a minute? And, you know, something very unthreatening to where they can say no if, they, if they're if they getting ready to go to the cage or something, you know, whatever you know, excuse they may want to make or if they don't want to talk to you. But um, I think one of the, the key things that I like to do, especially if I know ahead of time which players or, or coaches or whatever that I want to talk to, is to find out something about them um, maybe either something personal or a stat or something like that, that you can instantly relate to them to let them know that you understand who they are as either a player or a person. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Sean Doolittle, uh, the, the relief pitcher, went to the University of Virginia. And I mentioned I have started working in, in Charlottesville, where the University of Virginia is. And one time I remember I, I had not met him really before in an individual one-on-one -on -one situation. So I just mentioned the fact that, hey, I grew up in Charlottesville. And you know, did you know that uh, something was going on there? And it kind of broke the ice there. Sure. Uh, another example, uh, I remember in spring training, I was doing a story about uh, statistical metrics and things like that. And I wanted to talk to Adam Jones of the Orioles. And I, I had some a stat that he was one of the best in baseball in this particular past season on contact on balls in the strike zone. 
And so I, I went up to him and say, Adam, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about advanced metrics. And he was like, oh man, don't even think about that. I said, well, let me tell you this one thing. And I said, you know, you're one of the best. The metrics say that you're one of the best at hitting mm. balls in the strike zone. It's like, well, I like that stat then. <laughs> so it kind of broke the ice there. Uh, and we had a, a fantastic interview. So I, I think that's one of the things, uh, at least the tricks, tips that I have when I get ready for an interview. Definitely. Those are incredibly helpful. Janice, what kind of things have helped you out? Yeah. So uh, interviewing Tim Anderson, uh, I was uh, super honest with him. I think within the first uh, 10 seconds of approaching him, uh, I was like, hey, uh, Timmy, I got to be honest with you. Uh, you're my first interview. I am nervous as hell. <laughs> and so he, he looked at me and he's like, hey, it's all good. Don't be like, like we're people like we're all people. I mean, when it all comes down to it, uh, when it all boils down to the end of the day, like we're all human here. So, uh, yeah, kind of the um, uh, saying what uh, Steve said earlier, just kind of uh, know something about them to kind of bring that up to uh, work as an icebreaker. Uh, so the one I brought up with uh, Tim Anderson was, uh, so I, I knew that he played basketball in high school. Uh, and so did I. Uh, so we're, we're both kind of small uh, when it comes to the basketball world. Uh, so uh, I, I knew that we both played the same position point guard. So I, I talked to him a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, and the conversation actually went an interesting turn from there. We ended up talking about like the state of basketball in the Philippines of all places. <laughs> um, yeah, so after that, after like we just kind of uh, had that uh, nice uh, like dialogue going, uh, asking all the other questions, uh, all the baseball questions, all the metrics questions, just came so easily. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah, I, I um I made a terrible mistake. I, I've had two opportunities. It was just only in the spring. Uh, I got to talk to yeah, Jameson Tyone and Matthew Boyd, mm. and I, I made I, I definitely made a mistake that I uh, that fast and and I think Eno both loved and I mentioned it yesterday. But at the end of the Matthew Boyd interview, after it was all done and I knew that it didn't matter if I made the mistake, I told him that I am a Boyd boy, <laughs> and I know that you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. But I just could not resist the opportunity. And uh, I know for now not to do that. So, guys, that's my tip. Uh, don't don't say that you're a Boyd boy uh, to them. All right. That, that's that's easily it. Uh, so I, I, I kind of want to uh, I, I also want to focus, Janice, for you, because this year it's different. Right. Uh, with, with Steve, a little bit easier to approach people because there's no pandemic going on. Uh, what kind of difficulties was it for you to get these interviews uh, while you, you know, had to maintain six feet distance and uh, with masks on? Yeah, I mean, I, I did not actually cover any games in person during the regular season or postseason this year. And right. that is one of those things where you basically live on Zoom. Um, I, I was at spring training last year right before they closed all the camps down and uh, they were instituting you know outside interviews and things like that um and it's it's tough i think because you can't just hang out um have the players know you by sight i think that's one of the great advantages especially during spring training where if you're just there you're hanging around you're casual you have casual conversations things like that to where they recognize that you're here you're doing your job and you know, you're not threatening. And I right. think a lot of times, especially now with, with Zoom interviews and things, players don't know what your motivation is. You know, if you're going to do a hit piece on them or something sure. like that, um, it's it's hard for them to be comfortable where you would be in a non-pandemic setting, um, you know, just kind of hanging out and waiting your turn after, you know, a player talks to one reporter or group of reporters and you know he knows that you've waited and you had something that need, you needed to ask him. So I think that's what a, a what are the biggest um, implications of the way that things are are having to be done now versus how they've been done in the past. Yeah, and how has this been for you, Janice? 
It's been interesting, uh, just mainly because I had never uh, covered games in person before. Uh, so all I know is the, uh, the the pandemic world when it comes to covering baseball. Uh, so uh, I, I did attend about 30 uh, percent of the games in person. Uh, but even then, you're just kind of sitting in the ivory tower, I call it, in the press box. Hmm. Uh, and then uh, the uh, the White Sox uh, make uh Zoom interviews available uh, afterwards. So you get the Zoom link, uh, you're just simply in there with all the other beat writers uh, and just kind of uh, patiently kind of waiting your turn and uh, clicking on the uh, the raise hand button uh, to in order to ask a question. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's it's all just incredibly strange. And I think just from an audio perspective, when you're just sitting there six feet away from all of the other writers and all of like, say, the, uh, the opposing team writers too, you hear like kind of the residuals coming from headphones and from from electronic devices and it may it really made for a very strange experience uh oh. and I, I yeah just having never done this before uh yeah i can, can only imagine what it's like doing it uh say like being physically present in front of the players well we're looking forward to obviously you gain the opportunity to do it the right way right like it was in the before times so you hopefully so hopefully you get that experience this year uh, and you guys, I have another question that you guys already, you know, went into a little bit about icebreakers and approaching them. But you hinted on it here, Steve, and I think it's a really interesting one. Um, so you guys walk a difficult, difficult line in that you're trying to get honesty and truth, right, from someone who may be worried that you might weaponize it against them. It's such a fine line there. How do you guys do that? Let's start with you, Janice. Um, yeah, so... Just thinking back on, uh, say, uh, some of the conversations I've had, uh, everyone seems to be uh, just not really thinking that I'm going to yeah, write any hit pieces on them, which is always nice. <laughs> uh, I, I do remember uh, when I was interviewing Lucas Giolito, uh, like around the end of the season, uh, I just kind of asked him, uh, hey, so uh, what are your thoughts on the, the, the potentiality of James McCann coming back? And so that was kind of the big elephant in the room because all of us kind of knew that he was more than likely like not going to uh, return for the 2021 season. Uh, and I knew it was kind of like maybe an awkward question because I know that like he and Giolito are, are pretty close. Uh, so mm -hmm. I asked it anyway, and he basically gave me the answer uh, like, hey, like I would love to see him back. I mean, I think we all would, but that's definitely uh, uh, J James's uh, move to make uh, and whatever he decides, like I'm all for it. Uh, so that's probably, I guess, the, the most uh, in, in awkward territory I've gotten with a player. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yes, yeah, Steve, how many times have you walked on eggshells, essentially? And how do you go about that? It's it is difficult. And uh, I, I couldn't tell you. It, sometimes it depends, obviously, on, on the subject matter. I, I think if you if you show that you're prepared and you know you have a direct question you don't meander and you know start talking uh, have a long you know, preamble to your question right. i think that helps um i think about um again when we were uh discussing the the baseball you know and trying to ask about the baseball the uh the last couple of years um you sort of have to kind of feel out where the player is, you know, if, if he's a pitcher, you know, just start off with kind of a general question, you know, what do you think, uh, does the baseball seem different to you in any way or something mm -hmm. like that? And, and just start general and kind of read the room. I think that's, that's right. the most important way. If, if a player is, feels like he's opening up and, and discussing something uh, a little bit more in depth, then you go with it. And if a player is not, and he's giving you, you know, three sentence, uh, three word answers or something like that, you know, eh, it's probably not going to work here. I need to go up and maybe find somebody else to ask that sort of question. So it's, it's a lot of being able to have that, you know, back and forth with the person you're interviewing and knowing whether it's going somewhere or it's not. Yeah. Adaptation. That That's everything. Certainly. Uh, really, really great point. Uh, I want to get a glimpse of what your day in the life is like you know there's a you know there's a lot between just hey i'm credentialed and then all of a sudden being on the field uh and making the mistake of asking them questions during batting practice right so i i, I would love to hear this steve like when you get your credentials what is it like when you enter it are you just kind of when do you have to be there where do you hang out uh what is that like 
Well, the interesting thing, I mean, this for me, it feels like I grew up at uh, the ballpark or the stadium. My my dad was an usher at uh, University of Virginia football games and basketball games. So he would have to get there at like four hours ahead of time. Wow. So um, and the, the cool thing was, is that uh, they allowed the usher to bring a kid with them for free and get into the games, uh, this football especially. And so I would go as a, you know, 10 year old kid with my dad to the stadium at, you know, nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I'd have to just hang out and, you know, wait until the game started for anything. But I loved watching them come out, warm up, you know, the, the atmosphere, the smell, you know, the sights um, and the sounds and everything. So I get to the game generally you know, that four plus hours early just because I like to do that. I like to get set up. I like to know where I'm going to be in the press box or, or wherever, and then, you know, get my equipment set up and everything. And then just kind of chill, catch the vibe and, you know, watch and learn and listen and things like that. I, I love being at the park, at the ballpark mm -hmm. early and, uh, and seeing everything that goes on, watching batting practice, um, visiting all sorts of places around the stadium. Uh, so that's that's what I do, and it seems like time certainly just flies by once I get to the ballpark because you know I'm I'm excited. There's there's that little bit of of nervousness uh, when you're at the game. Yeah, and how about for you, Janice? Yeah. Uh, so essentially, uh, if, if if I'm on assignments, uh, what I would do is after leaving. Uh, my my tech support day job. I uh, throw all my, my computer, my laptop, my notebook, everything just goes uh, into my car and I drive down to the ballpark. Uh, so uh, because uh, this is a pandemic baseball, uh, the intake process was kind of like this, where I would uh, like socially distanced, uh, wait until uh, say anyone else entering the park is done with a routine temperature check. Uh, and then after that, I would uh, pick up my credential, uh, go through security, and take the elevator directly up to the 300 level. Uh, so uh, as a tier three uh, <laughs> credential holder, uh, yeah, I was was not allowed anywhere else uh, throughout the entire ballpark. Uh, essentially, it's just a straight shot uh, to mm -hmm. the press box. There were like three points of contact where someone would scan my credential and it got to be the point where, uh, yeah, say um, the White Sox staffers got to know who I was and it, it, we'd exchange niceties as I would pass by. Uh, they would ask me what kind of food I was bringing in. Um, not not because it wasn't allowed, because they were genuinely, genuinely curious of like right. what I was going to eat today. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so kind of like Steve, uh, what I like to, to do is kind of get there early. Uh, the other thing I also tried to do throughout the season is I knew that this was going to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I tried to take as many assignments as I possibly could. Like mm -hmm. I even moved uh, my work schedule around. Uh, sorry to anyone who works with me and, and, and is watching this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks for being accommodating, though. Uh, I definitely just tried to just soak up as much of it as I can because I knew that this might not ever happen again. Uh, so after I had everything set up, uh, I always just love uh, just the vibe of the ballpark uh, just right before all of the fans show up. It's almost like a cathedral. It, it, it's, it's, all, it, it's very church-like, in my opinion. Definitely, where you just oh, yeah. sit there, enjoy the vibe. Uh, and uh, to, to take a quick detour, uh, when I was in college, I used to work at the stadium. Uh, so I was the gift shop uh, uh, attendant. So I was slinging hats and jerseys. And this, uh, I might be dating myself here. Uh, this was around the 2004 through 2006 seasons. So uh, essentially the stadium was jam packed every day. Uh, just complete madness every day. Well, we, were, we never had any dull moments. So just to kind of, uh, you know, prepare for work and walk out like right behind home plate and just kind of uh, see the players take batting practice, uh, just kind of uh, get a feel for the ballpark, smell the grilled onions to kind of take the full on ambiance. Uh, so I always loved doing that in college. And so now uh, in my advanced age, uh, now I got to do that from the 300 level, uh, sans the grilled onions, of course. 
Uh, but yeah, other than that, after setting up my food, setting up my computer, um, and then just kind of pulling up all of the fact sheets and everything else I need to kind of do my job, uh, yeah, then it was time to work. So you're essentially in that press box from like, you know, 3.30 until 11 or so. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Yeah, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere else except the bathroom. Wow. Uh, so yeah, the the bathroom was always interesting too, just being like maybe one of like two two women uh, who were, were covering the team all year. So I essentially had my own private bathroom. That was cool. <laughs> Although I, I would no longer like to do that. I want to see more women in the press box though. Definitely, of course. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so you must have, I mean, gotten chummy with everybody else doing it as well. And and yeah, what is that atmosphere like in the press box? Yeah, uh, so everyone was always socially distanced. We were always sitting um, every other, uh, uh, I, I don't know, I want to call it a scansion. I'm not exactly sure what to call it. It's like <laughs> sure. a tiered, a set of tiers. I can't really like, like English right now, but yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, getting to know people was a little difficult, honestly, just mainly because we were all trying to navigate, uh, say, niceties. Uh, we all wanted to be professional, but at the same time, we also wanted to kind of follow protocol and uh, not be yelled at. Uh, sure. that, that was always something as someone, uh, I always thought I was low on the totem pole, so I, I would always just like be very careful of like how I act or how, how I say uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we did get to make some connections, I think, uh, via social media was the way to do it. I started following all of the other beat writers, uh, even the beat writers uh, who covered other teams, sure. I started following them too. Uh, and they would follow me back, which was always nice to see. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, yeah, it, it was a difficult situation to navigate, uh, just mainly because like one, you, you definitely want to be on your best behavior, but like on two, um, you definitely want to like make those connections and like kind of, uh, have some sort of a dialogue going. Yeah. I, I remember, um, again, my anecdotes, very minimal compared to your guys's. So, uh, I do remember going into the, the Yankee press box for spring training and the person that impressed me most, you know, there were a lot of people just kind of laying back and just whatever. And then there was Lindsay Adler headphones in laptop up iPad of the game on the right. Like, nope. It was amazing. I was like, yes, that is, I'm a Yankee fan. So, uh, cause I want to be happy in life. Right. So seeing that, <laughs> seeing Lindsay Adler is like our representation, like, yes, that's how you do it. Right. So I, I absolutely love that. Uh, and yes, yeah, Steve, I mean, for the press box for you, you have obviously a perspective outside of these, uh, quarantine times. What is it like for you? It's, it's a great, um, it's like one big chat room really, uh, sure. because yeah. when you're there and you can, you know, lean to the person on your left or your right and say, wow, you know, wasn't that a great play or shouldn't they have shifted here? Or, you know, there's so much discussion. It's, it's like one big, you know, maybe a big sports bar or something without right. the drink, right. but because you're all into the game, you're talking strategy. Um, for the most part, this happens, I would say for the first five, six innings. And then by the time the game gets into the later innings, you're writing your stories and trying to get things uh, in order, get your thoughts in, in line for who you're going to talk to and all that sort of stuff. But for the beginning of the game, um, it's a it's kind of a jovial atmosphere. And it's like you're at the game with your buddies and uh, you're talking baseball, which is which is tremendously fun because the institutional knowledge that's in that press box at mm -hmm. any given time is just fantastic. I mean, you could be, you know, Tom Boswell of the Washington Post, who's covered the game for 30, 40 years could be right behind you, you know, or right. Dan Shaughnessy, you know, pick out any legend, Joe Posnanski, uh, any of these guys could be, or, or, or ladies uh, could be in the press box. You could be next to Claire Smith, you know, legendary sports writers. So you never know. And I think that's, what's the really neat thing about it is you're watching a game that you love. You're talking about the game with people who know about the game and uh, it's just a, a wonderful experience that I wish everybody who loves baseball could get a chance to experience it. So, Steve, as the game is going on, you're uh, oftentimes you're crafting your story, right? As, as like as the game goes on, I've heard so many stories of like, oh, I have something on this, and the game shifts, and you just got to hit the lead <laughs> and all of it. How many times has that happened for you? And, oh, a ton. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's the what's the one that sticks out for you? The one I, I think that sticks out for me was the 2011 World Series Game Six between the Cardinals and the Rangers, uh, where oh, yeah. 
<laughs> the uh, the Rangers looked like they were going to win their first World Series oh, ever. Man. And, you know, it got down to where David Fries and, and you know, Nelson Cruz and, and all of that sort of stuff was happening. And there were three different versions of stories that I had to have going at once. Um, I was also, at that particular time, I was doing the blog, kind of like a lot, whatever our uh, idea of a live blog was at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm second guessing Ron Washington. I'm second guessing Tony La Russa for all of the decisions. And there were plenty of them to a second guess in that game. Sure. And I'm also responsible, if the Rangers do win, my post game assignment was to write the MVP story, which looked like Mike Napoli was going to win the MVP. And so I had to have that you know, started as well. And then it looked like the Rangers were not going to win and we were going to extra innings. And then it looked like the Rangers were going to win again. Josh Hamilton hits a home run and they go up in the top of the 10th. And so you've got all of these changes and it's, it's impossible almost to keep your word document straight, you know, where you're writing on each of those word documents and, and keep your wits about you especially while doing some live blog stuff. That was the most craziest. And, and the one thing that I remember was after the game was over, I knew that I had witnessed a tremendous historic game, but the details were all sort of really fuzzy because so much was going on. I wasn't locked in. I remember watching the game later, the replay of it during the pandemic when we had no baseball. It's like, Oh wow, that's right. That did happen, and they they brought in the you know Lance Lynn came in and, uh, and things like that that I had completely forgotten about because you're so caught up in the moment. Sometimes you don't realize what an amazing uh, historic moment you're you're witnessing. Oh yeah, I mean I remember actually um, writing. <laughs> uh, apologies, uh, it was I was helping out Jonah Carey back in the day. I uh, now I regret doing that, but uh, I I was doing Game Five of the um, the Astros Dodgers with him, mm -hmm. uh, and like I, my job was to cover every single home run that was hit. I don't know if you remember that game, but there were like oh, twelve yeah. home runs. Yes, <laughs> and he yes. he sold me this after like three of them, and I was like, okay, cool, I can tell like what happened in this at bat, and then it just kept happening. And I, I remember just going crazy. And this is the part that, I mean, for me, it was easy. I'm just at home. I'm watching the game, still enjoying it. And I'm writing this and I'm sending it to him. But what is lost in this, I think, as far as, you know, how much appreciation I have for you both here is, as we mentioned before, you have to be at the stadium right around like 3.30 or so. Let's say it's a 7.30 game. It's four hours, right? You have to also bake in the time to get to the stadium. So let's say that's an hour or whatever. Let's just be generous 30 minutes here. You have to also write the story at the end of it, too. Uh, I mean, sometimes that can go to, like, what, 1 a.m., 2 or so as you're finishing this longer? I mean, that's a, that is so much work just for one game that, you know, after Tuesday, you know, you put that out Tuesday morning, Wednesday happens, and it's like that that was it. That that's it, It's remarkable the amount of work that goes into this and the fact that you have to delete some of it Oh, it just hurts so much. Uh, Janice, did you have a moment like that this season? I sure did. <laughs> that much. So, uh, yeah, uh, uh, late in probably like the last 12 games of the season, uh, the White Sox very well uh, could have walked away with the AL Central e easily. They only had to win two out of their last 12 to take the division. Uh, and they, they won one game, one, one oh. lousy game. Uh, so uh, one of the games that I honestly thought that they might take was one against Cleveland. And from what I remember, uh, yeah, it was kind of a low scoring pitchers duel. Uh, Dallas Keuchel was doing Dallas Keuchel things, just kind of uh, serving ground ball outs. Uh, he was even striking guys out too. Uh, but of course, around eh, like maybe like the sixth inning, I know like maybe around the third time through the order, he tends to kind of falter a little bit. 
so yeah, basically what happened there. Uh, oh my goodness. I might have repressed a lot of this to be honest, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, essentially uh, what kind of happened there was that Rick Renteria brought uh, Carlos Rodon in. Um, he was recovering from an injury. Um, so before that, um, yeah, just uh, Rodon also just had uh, just a, a myriad of health problems. Uh, so to bring him into a high leverage situation like that, maybe it was kind of destined in the stars that this would not be the the other game that they would be winning. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I basically was writing it, talking about how great Dallas Keuchel was throughout the entire game. Uh, so, and then they end up losing, uh, in, in late innings. I can't remember how they lost, but, uh, it was heartbreaking. It was absolutely just, oh my goodness. But, uh, yeah, to kind of have to delete a lot of, uh, just copy you've already written, uh, is, is never fun. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, there's always like a dream too. I'm sure there's like a bargaining of like, no, I can save this for something else later on. And I'm sure you never touch it again. I mean, you just want to start fresh, right? right. Yeah. Especially if, you know, you think you might've written like a clever joke or, or made like a clever pop culture reference. Like you just kind of have to shelve it and maybe like hope that you can maybe use it again for the future. I would, yeah. I would say one thing uh, along those lines if you ever find yourself in that situation and you've written something, don't hit the delete button. Save that because so many times I would love to have a, a, a deleted draft and go back and say, what if, you know, this had happened, here was my story and have that play out, uh, you know, and, and actually publish that or something like that. I think those would be fascinating to read. And I have, I have, been uh, the victim of, you know, oh, I'll never need that again. I wish I had saved a bunch of those, that, that's especially, a fantastic idea. yeah, especially one, um, talk about being at the ballpark for a long time. Um, the 2014 NLDS, the San Francisco Giants and Washington Nationals at Nats Park went 18 innings. Um, and that was one of those, again, you had to rewrite and everything because that the Jordan Zimmerman had a shutout going into the ninth inning and uh, the, Drew Storen came in and blew the save and it went from ending in nine to finishing in 18. Um, but I would, I would love to have my Nationals win story uh, saved somewhere because it, it would be fun to look back on those days. Oh, an alternative man. history yeah yeah exactly yeah. i mean i would love a book yeah it's just called what if and then mm -hmm. i mean like the xkcd guy randall monroe but still monroe but still like one is just a collection of, of deleted articles from uh from journals i think that'd be amazing i want to read the mike napoli mvp story that's Gardner. right, that's really right. um so i want to talk a little bit more about the process that you guys go through when writing these, uh, I, I know it's changed over the years. I'm actually really curious about this, Steve. Um, nowadays, I mean, I you know, I, I got a, a sure microphone that I stick to my phone and I'm essentially like I've got good audio quality and that's that and that's just easy to send off into a podcast. I don't even need to write it, you know. But back in the day, I mean, was it, you know, you had your your notepad and pencil? Was it you had the tape recorder there? I mean, what is that process like getting those quotes and then turning it into that piece? Well, coming from a broadcast background, and that's what I had my degree in when I when I graduated from college, um, I've always had a tape recorder and a microphone. And mm -hmm. partly because trying to write quotes down on a notepad is impossible. I, I can't even <laughs> conceive of doing that and getting anywhere close to being accurate and keeping up with whatever anybody is saying. Uh, I'm I'm in awe of people that can do that. I just so, love the idea of the pencil behind your ear, yeah. though, you know, like, hey, say, you were saying in the seventh inning. That's right. And uh, so I, I I, have a recorder, you know, uh, the, the recorders thankfully have gotten smaller since I sure. uh, started in the business, but um, I've got to have that audio. And I love being able to have the actual audio files if we want to do something um, for the web, for instance, or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I will say... I remember I did a, a spring training interview with Tommy Lasorda maybe 10, 15 years ago. And when he passed away just recently, I remembered, hey, wait, I had an interview with Tommy Lasorda. Let me see if I can find that audio somewhere and was able to go and dig that up 
and we put it out along with the Tommy Lasorda obituary that we ran online. So, I mean, that to me is one of the great fun things that we can do if we have, you know, the archive of, of uh, that audio or, you know, talking to Cody Bellinger when he was a rookie and hadn't had any major league experience, you know, in spring training before he came up, you know, having that sort of uh, interview and that audio, I think is, is fantastic. So for me, the process begins with holding the microphone up and then coming back to my computer and downloading the audio file and then transcribing what I have, what I need and putting that into the story. That's great. And by the way, uh, chat, we are reading everything here. We'll have a moment at the end to answer your questions. So feel free to ask them now. I see Joel Hennard says uh, to you, Steve, you should ask to see his mic. It's impressive. Uh, if you have it, I I'm going to ask, obviously, Janice, uh, the same question. So if you wanted to show it to us, that was the time to find it. Uh, but Janice, yeah, what is your process uh, getting these quotes and, and turning them into these fantastic pieces? Yeah, uh, so perhaps one um, one advantage of the, uh, I guess, the pandemic uh, protocol baseball is that, uh, yeah, the White Sox would email all of us uh, the the Zoom conference and a nice little uh, post-recorded package. Uh, so yeah. if I happen to miss anything or if there's uh, perhaps something uh, juicy that I might want to include, sometimes I would kind of just rewatch the Zoom and then uh, insert quotes uh, wherever, uh, wherever applicable. So. Oh, nice. Okay. And uh, do you, so like finding, okay, getting that quote, right? Getting the thing that you need. Uh, I know, for example, we talked to Eno yesterday and I know that he has like Zach Ranke's number and Zach, I think he, I remember him telling me another time, like he sends him a text and then like four months later, Granky will respond because he's <laughs> Zach Granke. Yeah. Uh, do you guys, I mean, I don't, I'm not asking like, oh, how connected are you? But um, do you have those options? And if so, how do you go about you know, using that uh, for for your articles. Uh, Janos, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, so essentially uh, the way I'll do it is, especially if I hear uh, a player uh, say something that will uh, round off the article nicely, uh, I will definitely include that in there. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, one notable thing uh, that I remember is, um, yeah, I, I inserted a really great uh, Lucas Giolito a quote when he's uh, talking about, I guess, his working relationship uh, with James McCann. Mm -hmm. And so I actually have it up here where he said... Let's see. Oh, that's not the right thing. Uh, but essentially, uh, he just was uh, expressing uh, how incredibly uh, important McCann is uh, to uh, his uh, uh, his work day and how uh, he, how much he actually contributes uh, to helping Giolito. Uh, yeah, uh, pitch. So uh, yeah, it all depends on I guess like what I'm tr what what I'm trying to prove or what I'm trying to demonstrate. Nice. Uh, how about you, Steve? Um. Uh Give me the question again. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. More of like you have extra contact with these players. How do you go about kind of talking to them? And what's that kind of process like? A little bit different than just being in the clubhouse with them. You might have some extra interaction with them outside of it. How do you go about approaching that? Yeah, I, I think the, the thing for me, um, from my perspective, is in being not a beat writer and not uh, focused on one team, um, it's harder for me to get those relationships to where I can, you know, call somebody or or, or get a, a text or anything like that. I'm not on the not on the Eno basis um, <laughs> sure. with, with players, so I, I have to go through the PR departments, especially now, mm -hmm. um, and that's what um, that's what I have to uh, you know that's my process. But in terms of you, you do have to be persistent sometimes too. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned is that you can't just put in a, an interview request and expect them to make the next move. A lot of times you may have to follow up an, a second time or a third time, or sometimes sure. more than that to be able to, to land an interview. And sometimes they'll still say no. I mean, that's, right. that's that you have to deal with frustration um, and know an, an awful lot in the business. Um, but, the times that they do say yes, uh, those are the times where you know it, you feel good about yourself and being able to craft a story that maybe nobody else has at that at that moment. Sure. Um, so, so for a little bit more of a fun question, uh, you both have interviewed many players. Uh, Janice, what player surprised you the most uh, when you met them? Oh my goodness. Um, 
I would probably say uh, the player that surprised me the most was uh, Gio Gonzalez. Mm. Uh, I know that like he's had a history of just being incredibly cordial and nice uh, to to the media, and so uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm not uh, ad- uh, answering this question correctly, but I have I, I, I didn't know what I was expecting uh, from from what other people have told me. Um, they're like, yeah, yeah, Gio is really nice and personable and great with the media, uh, and uh, yeah, he he was the same uh, with me uh just uh address me by my name uh which I, I guess was probably the biggest surprise that he was actually taking the time to like get to know me um yeah so that that's probably the closest i've come to a a, a very pleasant surprise yeah yeah that's great uh it's good to know i mean we're all rooting for geo to, to land somewhere and to revitalize his career it didn't work out with us last year but hey i'm i'm hoping that like he at least uh, goes for one more year Right, he should. There's got to be enough club. Maybe the Marlins use as a number five, or okay. I don't know. Maybe the Maris can do a seven man rotation. We'll find out. Hi, <laughs> uh, Steve. How about you? Um, I, I think one of the things to to um to point out before answering the question is that in interviewing, it's a lot easier to talk to players during spring training uh, than it is during the regular season, and and get an actual. Um, in-depth kind of interview. And I think that's where the best interviews that I've done have taken place. I think one that that strikes me um, that I can remember, and there too, that I, that I, I want to mention, one was Joey Votto. And that was, that. I think the interview that I did with Joey Votto was one where I realized the importance of being prepared because Joey Votto will question you back to make mm. sure you know what you're talking about. And I think we've seen the way that he has um, interacted with reporters over the last several years. This was back a little while ago where he wasn't the real established star. And so you you didn't really hear of his reputation um, or didn't know uh, of him as somebody who who will play with you and, and kind of put you on the defensive. But if you answer the question right, or if you show that you have knowledge, he'll welcome you in and really give you good information. So sure. I think that was one that that opened my eyes. And and two, David Price is a guy who has uh, uh, there's a big spectrum in terms of perception of David Price from both very good and very bad, um, and and the way that he has dealt with some reporters and members of the media. Uh, I remember going up and talking to him a couple of springs ago, and uh, again. Somehow or another, somebody told me, or I knew that, or I read that he had done Pilates in the off season. And that was kind of the icebreaker that I used to talk to him. And this was a one-on-one situation during spring training. And he was at his, you know, at his, uh, his locker. And we had an interview that proceeded from that, talked about, you know, his recovery from whatever injury he was, was having, and then looking forward to the upcoming season. And, um, I, I don't think I've ever had a player say this to me afterwards, but we finished. I said, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. And I uh, said, yeah, uh, you too. And as I was walking away, he said to no one in particular there in the clubhouse, said that now that was an interview. And uh, I'm like, <laughs> Oh wow. How about that? You know, and I'm, I'm leaving the clubhouse. So I'm not really, I didn't turn around or acknowledge him or anything like that, but he could tell that other players were around his locker and we're listening and overhearing what we were talking about. But um, to have him just out of the blue say that, it's like, wow, that's, that's like the amazing. nicest thing any player's ever said to me. <laughs> so, but I had to play it cool, you know, or else of then course. you turn into a, 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 a price boy, you know, instead of a boy. Price boy. boy, there you go, right? No. I am a price boy now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so kind of with the same idea, I what players do you want to interview? I mean, if you right now say, oh, I want to talk to that person and I have all these questions I want to ask. Uh, Janice, we'll start with you. Who are you hoping in 2021 that you get a moment to talk to? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I feel as if in 2020, I didn't talk to enough people. Uh, mm-hmm. So in 2021, uh, I, I, I would love to speak to anyone, like especially now. Uh, in the past, uh, I might not have been uh, as confident enough as maybe I am now. Uh, so now that I am a little more confident, uh, 
Yeah, I like want to talk to everyone and anyone. Uh, probably a big one on the top of my list, maybe like slightly controversial, is maybe Tony La Russa. Um, it's mainly because he's such like an old school, uh, just baseball head, uh, and I'm the exact opposite. Uh, so <laughs> I think um, I'd like to approach that with just uh, some uh, open uh, curiosity and honesty as well. Uh, so yeah, that's probably like who I would like to speak to the most. I would like to listen to you speak to Tony Russo. <laughs> so I, I can't wait for that. I, I imagine you will get your opportunity shortly, and uh, this should be very exciting. Um, You'll hear Steve. about it when I do. Yeah. Steve, how about you? Well, that, I, Janice's answer is a great one. I, I wish I uh, had thought of that because I'm just thinking from a fan standpoint, you know, I want to talk to Fernando Tatis Jr. Yes. I want to talk to, I want to talk to, so, you know, the, the great players, you know, Mookie Betts, or I, I think really um, maybe Justin Turner might be one who I would like to talk to. I don't know how far I would get to find out exactly what happened during game six and, and that day but I'd be interested in finding that out. Um, so there, there's so many stories and, and uh, so many players and managers and, and everything else um, that I would love to be able to interview. Uh, but I, I like Janice's answer because we, we do need, we do need somebody to, uh, to talk to Tony Roos, Tony La Russa and get some answers for stuff. Well, can, can either of you talk to Joe Musco for me? I just hmm. want to know what it's like in San Diego and not in Pittsburgh. And, and <laughs> he's got to be one of the happiest good. people this off season. Huh? Right. I mean, it, it, he's got to feel so great for the year ahead. He's also dealt with injuries. I would love to know if he's feeling okay. And hopefully, you know, averaging 93, 94, as opposed to 92, 93. Um, so I'm relying on you both here. Okay. I need you to do that for me. Thank you very much. Oh uh, no. So we have only a couple minutes left. I really want to, um, you know, put a button on this and look at the takeaways that people should have um, with this. So I'm going to ask you both here uh, what tips you would give someone else that's just starting. You just got your MLB credentials. Great. Now, what is the thing, the, the pitfalls they should not fall into, the biggest one for you? I'll start with you, Steve. Well, I would say if if there's somebody that you know that is going to be at the same game, um, if you can find – I mean, writers are really – um, willing to help out and to let other people know some of the benefits of their knowledge. And I, I know that if I see anybody new um, in a press box, I'm, I'm more than willing to answer any questions or anything like that. So if you're new, maybe you go up to somebody um, in the press box, a fellow writer or, or somebody like that, introduce yourself. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself. And like Janice was saying, if it's your first interview or if you're new, let people know because they know that everybody's there to do a job. And if, if I had known the ropes and not knowing to go up and talk to players up by the batting cage, if somebody was there to let me know that I would have felt a lot more comfortable. So I think getting comfortable is important and um, allowing other people who do know uh, all the ins and outs of things to help you along that. Um, I think that can smooth your pathway. Absolutely. I had Eno, for example, uh, show us the ropes and I He's can't a good one. thank him enough yeah. for that. Uh, and giving us tips right after our Boyd discussion too. It was, it was something else. He said, Hey, Nick, don't call him a Boyd boy. Okay. <laughs> uh, Janice, uh, what about you? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, what Steve said is absolutely true. Uh, just to uh, open a dialogue uh, with, with other writers. Everyone that I've met so far has been just super nice and just willing to help. Because at the end of the day, like you're all just trying to do a job and you're all just trying to uh, say, like provide baseball coverage. And of course, like during during a pandemic, like where, where no fans are in the stands, like that was such like an awesome and important job to have. And so I'll never take that for granted. So uh, yeah, some of the writers that have reached out to me have been absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, Scott Merkin, uh, the White Sox MLB beat writer, uh, he, he was probably one of the first to try to befriend me. Um, super awesome dude, like oh, have, have uh, benefited greatly from his guidance. Uh, other writers too, um, like uh, Kat Garcia, uh, Shakia Taylor, like all great people who definitely want to see um, the, the scope of baseball coverage become more diverse and uh, introduce as many uh, different voices as possible. So. Great, great answer there. Uh, I, we'll take one or two questions very, very quickly here. Uh, Noah Scott has a question. He says, how do you develop trust with sources within the industry? We'll start with you, Steve. 
Well, it's it's not easy. And I, I think just by being fair in what you write um, goes a long way toward uh, developing confidence in people dealing with you. Um, they know that you're not going to, to do a hatchet job or something like that. Um, I, and I think not trying to, to make sure that everything goes on the record and in a story. I mean, if, if you need to, um, you don't need to quote everybody every single time um, and uh, just pick the, the best quotes and things like that. Uh, I, I think that helps to some degree. Definitely. How about you, Janice? Yeah, I'm not really the uh, the inside scoop person <laughs> on my staff. <laughs> sure. I don't I don't know if maybe like they, they don't trust me enough. No, I'm, I'm kidding. They, they, they probably do. Uh, but I guess uh, when it comes to uh, other people saying that they have sources, uh, I, I always try not to like pry or ask because, hey, you know, sometimes uh, that's a trusted relationship that, 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 that uh, can't be broken for whatever reason. Uh, so yeah, especially if I hear something on the inside, I always try to take it with a grain of salt. Um, mm -hmm. So in a past life, I was a librarian, so I'm big on just like preventing the spread of misinformation. So uh, yeah, when it comes to anything or hearing anything on the inside, I always like make sure that uh, yeah, I, I one treat it with respect, but also to just try to um, yeah, uh, be be ju judicious in what I say. Definitely. Uh, yeah, of course, Baller Librarian, uh, the, the Twitter handle that I used incorrectly last year that I won't forget about. Uh, but no, really, uh, that, that's going to do for this panel. Uh, Steve, Janice, thank you so much for being a part of this. Uh, Janice, actually, we'll see you again tomorrow in the Inclusivity in Baseball panel, which is I'm really looking forward to that one. Uh, but yeah, this this is a fantastic look into what it's like. And we don't really talk about this enough. And hopefully this helps people that are just getting started with this. And Hopefully we'll be on the field soon um, with you guys. So really, thank you so much for being a part of PitchCon and being here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite, Nick. Take care.